evidence is in, and we now know that a healthy microbiome is the key to our health and longevity. I'm Sarah Moore, and I'm a registered nutritionist and health practitioner. And I'm here to explain the current evidence on gut health and give you a checklist of practical strategies of what you can do to live your healthiest life with a healthiest gut. So the human body has got 10 times more microbial cells than human cells. There are trillions and trillions of little living creatures living and dying in your body right now. They're invisible to the naked eye, uh, but these microbes help us live and function. And I like to think of them as little pets being nurtured in your gut. Now, the largest concentrations live in our digestive system, in our gut. And that's why we talk about this concept of gut health. Now, we're used to think that these good and sometimes bad bacteria just affect how we digest food. But we now know that there is so much more to these little critters than we used to think. Uh, they've got such a big role to play in our health and they've probably got something to do with obesity, food allergies and diseases that are rapidly increasing in the Western world. We now understand that these microbes can even talk to our brain, they influence our immune system and they can even modify our genes. So let's get stuck in and find out a little bit more about them. So this photo is a photo of me and is a little reason about why I wanted to get into food and nutrition um, when I was in high school. Um, I have always been interested in food, in the food we eat, in the foods that different cultures eat, and it started at a very young age and that's where my interest lies. So it makes no, it makes a lot of sense that I'm interested in, it, in it, the gut and how our gut functions and how we can live our healthiest lives while also enjoying our life and being happy and healthy. So that leads very well into our talk about gut health today as we learn the synergistics behind our brain and our gut working together. So let's start off and think about what gut health actually is. So it's reported in the media a lot. We see it on social media all the time. And there's plenty of commercial enterprises out there cashing in on this idea of gut health. And it seems to give us a pretty small, simplistic view of what goes on in our stomach. But that's actually not true. Gut health actually is about the optimal functioning of our entire digestive system. It's nine metres long. So it's coiled up inside each and every one of us and it operates a little bit like a factory, like the cartoon on this slide here. And it starts with our mouth and it goes all the way until our anus. Yep, where our poo comes out. Now, most of us are quite conscious about what we put into our mouths, the food that we choose to eat, but we have very little idea of what actually goes on once we've chewed and swallowed that food. But that's key to know, to knowing about gut health is knowing about our inner workings and what happens with the foods that we eat. So if you ever feel a little bit bloated or a little bit constipated, we can figure out what's going on and how to remedy that. We're also going to bust a few myths that you've probably heard out there. So let's look at how the gut works. So if we start off with our mouth. That's the beginning of our digestive system. So this is where we start to physically break down the food with our teeth and also with some digestive enzymes that are in our saliva. So let's think about you eating an apple. You start out with a whole apple in your hand, you start taking a bite, and then you start to chew it. You're already breaking that down. It's making your job easier for your stomach, which would have a pretty hard time digesting a whole apple. It then goes down the esophagus, which is our food pipe, into our stomach. Now the stomach acts a little bit like a washing machine because it physically moves the food around, it gets tumbled around, adding in some hormones, some more digestive enzymes and some acid. The food gets cleaned and it gets broken down even further. So that apple that we're eating, it's now turned into like an apple sauce or an apple puree. Our food then makes its way down a really long windy tube called the small intestine, which is actually a pretty ridiculous name because our small intestine is six meters long. Now this is where the key nutrients that we've been eating, like our vitamins and our minerals and our macronutrients, get absorbed into our bloodstream. They get carried to this, our cells and our organs to where they're needed. That's where our fuel gets into the rest of our body. Now the food then makes its way um, down into the final part of our digestive system. That's the big tank with the brown sludge at the bottom there. That's our large intestine. Now, previously, not many nutrition researchers were interested in this part of the digestive system because that's just where we make poo. But what we have found is that there is trillions of microorganisms that live in this area. And these are the essential microorganisms that make up our microbiome that you've heard about, okay? Now, the large intestine is 
not just for important for our digestive health, but also the health of our entire body. Okay, so the importance here isn't just our poo health, which is quite important, uh, but this is where the magic happens because this is the home of the microbiome. So when I talk about microbiome, what I'm really talking about is that's the sciencey word for the trillions of bacteria and some other microorganisms that inhabit the gut there. Okay. So this nine meter long digestive tract is really important for the health of our whole body due to three main reasons. Okay, the first one is digestion, because no matter how good the quality of food that you put into your body is, if you don't have a very good working digestive system, your body can't make the most of those nutrients. So it's essential that your body is digesting food properly to get the most out of those foods, right? So we need to have good gut health to make the most of our choices. Now, the second uh, topic here is really topical at the moment, and that's our immune system, because 70% of our immune system cells live along the digestive tract. And that's why we know that people who have better immune systems tend to have better gut health. Now, when I was first studying nutrition at university, uh, this point would have even made it to the slides. We just didn't have the evidence then. It seems like a bit of a far out topic. But very recently, we've had a few landmark studies um, that have discovered this to be the case which is really exciting. So it's important to note that having good gut health isn't going to prevent you from getting any diseases, like it's not gonna prevent you from getting COVID, but having a good healthy gut and digestive system can have a protective effect on how seriously we become affected by diseases and how well our body bounces back afterwards. But it's this third reason, the microbiome, these trillions of microorganisms, that's really the game-changing discovery that's making us think differently, not only about how we prevent and manage health conditions, but about how we increase longevity, how we can live longer. And it's a really exciting time to be in nutrition science, and I think so anyway. So these little critters that you can see here, this is a cartoon, by the way, it's not what they really look like, um, have really varied roles. So we've got different types of bacteria, um, different varieties, and they've all got different skill sets. Some of them stimulate the immune system, they can break down potentially toxic foods, they can synthesize vitamins and amino acids like B vitamins and vitamin K, they can produce short, -time, short chain fatty acids, which are essential for our brain health, and they can also protect against certain pathogens. Now, a healthy gut is not only associated with living longer and less disease, stronger immune systems, but also better mental health, better mood, uh, healthy weight management. And in fact, our gut health is linked to the function of every other system and organ in the body, including the brain, the lungs, even our kidneys. So you may have heard of the landmark study which discovered the gut-brain axis that came out a few years ago. And this was the first study of its type that discovered that particular diet, the Mediterranean diet, uh, can improve mental health in the same way that stress and mental health can affect our digestive system, our gut health can influence our brain and our brain health. Now, what does a healthy gut look like? Well, unfortunately, it's pretty hard to tell from the outside how well you're doing. Obviously, you can have uh, symptoms that can indicate and be a bit of a red flag for things not going on, that things aren't going very well. So having reflux, constant pain, uh, excessive flatulence, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, those kind of things are normal to occur sometimes, especially after you've visited a buffet or had a really heavy meal. But if they're happening often, it could be a red flag that something's going on and it would be worth seeing your GP or a dietitian. But for most of us, we're not gonna be able to tell really what's going on in our gut. Um, so the two things we want to keep an eye on, uh, that we want to be happening, that we can't keep an eye on, are variety and quantity. So our healthy gut contains a wide variety of different microorganisms, right? And we should have a large variety of different bacteria. Now, they've all, remember they've all got different skill sets, so we need to harness that. We want really big populations so that they can all work together to do a really good job within their skill set. So that's the population, that's the quantity of bacteria of each type. We want lots of them. But we also want a diverse range of skills so that our whole body benefits. And this is where the variety comes in, okay? So that we get the full benefit of healthy hormones, immunity, mood, weight, etc. You know the rest of the list. Now, unfortunately, we don't recommend the use of private poo screenings, what you may have seen. You pay a couple of hundred dollars online, you get a test kit, you send off a poo sample, and they tell you what uh, microorganisms they found in your waste matter. Now, unfortunately, it's not actually very helpful from a medical perspective. 
Watch this space though, because in about 10 years, it will be, and it will probably be a really good way of directing our individual healthcare. What we know about our gut is that everybody has an individual ideal microbiome, a little bit like a fingerprint. So my ideal microbiome balance of the different bacteria and different populations is going to look different compared to yours. It's going to vary depending on the environment we grow up in, our genetics and our own needs. We've also got to keep in mind as well that some different species of bacteria can function with the same role. They can do the same thing. So there's no such thing as the ideal template. So that's why these testings don't give us much useful information because we just aren't at the stage yet where we can translate in that into useful information. So save your money and instead we are going to focus on things that we can do instead that make a real difference. Now I should also note as well that um, unmanaged or undiagnosed food intolerances and food allergies can have a really massive impact in the gut and even if you're doing all the right things if you've got an underlying allergy in particular, this could be um, contributing to uh, poor nutrient absorption and you could actually be damaging your gut. So if you have a persistent um, gut symptoms or you've got an inkling that you may have a food that particular food that doesn't agree with you, it's definitely worth getting a formal diagnosis um, through the pathway of a GP and then an accredited practicing dietitian to get that managed first. As I said, some um, allergies and intolerances, they may not be the obvious culprit um, and it's definitely worth getting that checked out. That should be your number one priority. So there's a few different things that affect our microbiome and the quality of the bacteria in our gut. There's a few things that we can't do much about, like how we were born, our family's genes, where we live, and any medications that we might need to take. So it's really not worth dwelling on them. What we do does make a big difference, though, is the modifiable things, the things that we can change. How much fibre we eat, the prebiotic types of fibre that we eat, maybe boosting with some probiotics, uh, how much processed foods we eat, how stressed we are, how much sleep we get and how much exercise we do. These are the things that make a real difference to our gut health. So let's get stuck into the reason why you're watching this and that's diet and a healthy gut. So we know that a plant-based diets are the key to a healthy gut. That's it, that's the secret. It's eating more plants. Now it doesn't mean that you need to be vegetarian or vegan because that's not the case. And it doesn't mean the meat and dairy products are unhealthy because they're not. Uh, but plant-based diets come on a spectrum. It just means that the majority of your diet, the most of the foods that you eat during the day come from plants. So that could be whole grains, seeds, nuts, fruits, veggies, anything that's edible that grows on a plant counts as a plant food. Um, and so there is room for dairy and meats if you want to. Now, if you choose to be vegan or a strict vegetarian, you might need to be a little bit more savvy at making sure you get enough protein, vitamin B12, iron and calcium. Uh, but if you enjoy eating meat and dairy, then that's fine too. The reason I love the plant-based diet approach is because it doesn't focus on cutting any foods out. No food is off limits. It's just about getting more foods in. It's also important to know here that there is no magic gut superfood. I see this all the time on social media and news articles saying the five foods that you need to include in your shopping this week to heal your gut. These are all nonsense. The key is getting as much variety and quantity of plant foods in your day, in your week as you can. So, and diversity here is king. So there is no one superfood, all of them count and all of them matter. So the focus needs to be on whole foods, minimally processed foods, foods that you can eat you know, as, as natural as possible. Some processing is fine, you know, it's fine to eat rice and pasta. Whole grain varieties are better because they're higher in fiber. Now fiber is the most important part of this gut health puzzle. You also will see it um, it's called prebiotics. So there's different types of fiber and different bacteria bacteria like different types of fiber and they like different foods. They've got their own taste preferences. So in order to look after that diversity and those different types, you've got to think about eating a wide variety of different foods. Um, any of you that have got kids, any fussy eaters, you'll know that it can be really hard to feed a whole family, a table full of people with all of their favorite foods. You need a lot of variety, different ingredients that they're going to like. It's same with nourishing the bacteria in your gut. You need to eat lots of different foods to keep them all happy. So we know that, we also know that fibre helps you have healthy poos, which is really important, but it's only recently that we've understood the importance of fibre for nourishing these gut bacteria. Now, the key thing about fibre is that it travels all the way down those nine metres of our digestive tract 
undigested because human cells don't have the enzymes needed to digest this fiber. So it makes it all the way down to the bacteria and they digest it for us. Now, the good thing about this is they then produce a range of different chemicals that benefit our body but when they break these fibers down. They can do things like regulate our appetite, communicate with our brain. They're really important chemicals. And it's not just about feeding the microbiome though. Studies have shown that by increasing our fiber by eight grams a day can reduce our risk of heart disease by 19%, our risk of type two diabetes by 15%, and our risk of colon cancer by 8%. Now, eight grams of fiber is just a regular potato with the skin on or a cup of veggie sticks and hummus, or a small can of baked beans, that's it. And you're reducing your risk of those diseases. Now, I find the trick here is to find tasty and delicious ways of eating uh, more fiber every day from a wide variety of different um, fruits, veggies, legumes, grains, seeds, nuts, all of those foods. Find ways that you enjoy it because this is gonna be a long process and start enjoying your food more because that's going to help too. Now, the amount, uh, the ideal amount of fiber for an individual depends. Uh, typically, more is better. Our current recommendations are 25 grams of fiber per day for women and 35 grams for men. Now, this is the bare minimum to making sure that you get enough for your baseline health. For optimal gut health, we wanna be having as much as possible. If you're not used to having a lot of fiber in your diet, you can run into a little bit of trouble all of a sudden eating a lot of fiber. You need to build up slowly and that makes it a little bit more of a sustainable habit too. And you also need to drink more water and move to get that fiber down the nine meters of your digestive system so that you don't feel a little bit, um, a little bit clogged up. Oopsies. Now, I've got a challenge for you. I would love for you over the next week to keep a little tally somewhere or a score of the amount of plant foods you eat. Now we all know the message, go for five, go for two and five, go for two serves of fruit and five serves of vegetables every day. But for this plant points exercise, I don't mind how much of the foods you eat. What I want you to do is look at the different types of plant foods that you eat each day. So if you had white rice, that gets a tick. If you had an apple, that gets a tick. If you had a cos lettuce, that gets a tick. And we want to see how many different plant foods do you get each day? Because what we know is that people tend to eat the same foods on repeat. Think about the last time you went to the supermarket, look in your trolley, do you buy the same fruits and vegetables every week because you know you'll get them eaten? I find this especially true when people are starting to eat better or they're focusing on eating well. They've got broccoli and cauliflower and spinach in their trolley, but not much else. So keep a tally and see how close you are to 30 points. That's the goal, 30 plant points a week. And I've got a few hacks for you. So it's not just about different vegetables because we, you know, we wanna be focusing on fruits and veggies that are in season and are affordable. And we don't really want you coming home with 30 different vegetables in the week because you're gonna to struggle to find a way to cook all of those and get them into your day. 30 different plant points across different grains, different fruits, different veggies, different legumes, different nuts and seeds, also included are herbs and spices, even cocoa, coffee and tea. They're plant points too. We get good things from them. Now, my ultimate tip here is to try and find some multi-packs. So you don't need to buy 30 different ingredients every week. Try mixed bags of salad, four bean mix instead of a can of lentils. Okay, so if you just bought a can of lentils, a bag of rice, and some lettuce and a bag of almonds, you'd have four plant points. But if we switch them up to the varieties on the side that are those mixed bags, four bean mix, brown rice medley, mixed nuts, superfood salad, all of a sudden you've got 18 plant points. Okay, so think about getting creative in the shop of buying mixed products because variety here is the key. So we still need to make sure that we're getting our two and five every day, but think diversity and you'll get more bang for your buck. You'll be able to look after your gut health without increasing the cost of your groceries too much. Now research shows us that by focusing on these plant points, and a plant-based diet, you actually don't need to focus on too many other health initiatives. So you won't need to be counting calories, you won't need to be cutting out foods that aren't healthy because you're shifting your mindset about including more. So it's making healthy eating seem more generous and it's less restrictive, but it's also gonna tick off those other things. If you're getting 30 plant points a week, chances are you're going to end up eating less sodium, less saturated fat, less processed foods, those kinds of things. So it's a much more sustainable way of eating. 
My next tip for maximizing your gut health is to chew your food. Yes, really, I'm telling you, you need to chew your food more. Now, often us nutritionists get a little bit of slack for focusing on the simple initiatives because I know what you really want is you want the magic bullet. What can I take? What supplement's going to fix everything? And unfortunately or fortunately, usually it's the really simple things that can make the most difference. So remembering back to the beginning where we talked about the role of the digestive system, remember that digestion starts in the mouth. So how well we chew our food, if we can get that nice and soft and the digestive enzymes have got a long time to actually act on the food, we're making the job of our stomach and our small intestine even easier so first of all they don't have to work as hard but it means we're going to get a better result with maximizing how much nutrients gets absorbed in the small intestine it's also going to reduce things like bloating and slow digestion um, further down the tract because we've already initiated that process a little bit more it's giving our digestive system a head start so when you don't chew properly, it's more likely that air and large particles are going to get trapped in the stomach. And this is what causes bloating. So we um, calculate that about 70% of people with frequent bloating uh, can actually be remedied just by sufficient chewing. So you need to put in a sustained effort into this and it can be hard to fall back into old habits. So set yourself some reminders and chew at least 10 to 20 times between mouthfuls. If you suffer from bloating, make that 20 to 25 times between mouthfuls. Have a go with your next meal and I bet you're not chewing um, at 20 times. I even need to remind myself, so we're not all perfect. Perfection doesn't really matter. Just make more of an effort uh, to chew better. It can also mean that you're more in tune with what you're eating, right? So we, the more slowly you chew, you're able to practice mindful eating. You really taste your food a lot more. You appreciate it better. Um, and you're going to be more aware of your appetite and recognizing signs of fullness rather than scoffing a food meal down really quickly and thinking, wow, what happened? Where did it go? The next point that's equally as important as nutrition is looking at other things that affect our gut. And we have just as much evidence on the effects of sleep, stress and exercise as we do on diet. Okay, well, there is so much evidence that our microbiome and sleep in particular are interconnected via this gut brain axis. So microbial diversity can be affected um, due to your total sleep time as well as your sleep quality. So it's important that you are getting enough sleep, but you're also getting really good quality sleep. So we need um, really good quality sleep to protect these little guys in our gut because they need rest too. Uh, as well as increasing inflammation and stress hormones, which might explain why and not enough sleep is associated with increased gut symptoms, particularly if you're suffering from IBS, you might notice this. But we know that lack of sleep also affects our hunger and satiety hormones, so ghrelin and leptin. So if you notice when you're sleep deprived, you may be more likely to eat more or reach for the more unhealthy treats and cravings when you're tired. It's because of these hormones. So getting enough sleep looks after our bacteria, but also helps the choices that we make too. Now, the lack of diversity with our gut microbiome can impact on our sleep patterns as well. So studies have shown that microbe depletion is associated with a lack of serotonin in the gut, which we know can affect our sleep and wake cycles. So it's a reciprocal relationship here, right? The quality of our gut affects our sleep and the quality of our sleep affects our gut. Now, if you, you can, tips to improve sleep include practicing really good sleep hygiene. If you have a Google of sleep hygiene, you'll get some good tips there. It's things like avoiding caffeine and alcohol before bed, reducing blue light exposure, adopting sleep routines and relaxation techniques. There's plenty of information about that or your GP can help you if you are suffering from poor sleep. Now, stress. Stress is really important as well. Have you noticed that stress can trigger symptoms like constipation, bloating, diarrhea? If you ever get a little bit nervous, you'll find that you've got butterflies in your tummy. So we already know there's a relationship there that how the brain is feeling affects how our digestive system works. And it's due to this gut-brain connection that feeling stress plays a really big um, role with our gut health. So not just our digestion, but also how our bacteria are feeling and coping as well. So it goes both ways, doesn't it? Um, as they pass through the blood-brain bar barrier impacting our mood. So happy microbes are gonna give you a happy you. So if we can look after them, we feel a little bit better within ourselves. Now trials have shown that by 
um, modifying our gut microbiota with simple diet and lifestyle strategies, like having your 30 plant points, following a Mediterranean style diet, exercising more, reducing stress, we can help manage mental health issues, including how we cope with stress and how we feel the symptoms of depression and anxiety. And a few small changes can make a really big difference to enhance brain performance. So how do you relax? However you find um, your body relax, do that more. It could be meditation and mindfulness. It could be a walk in nature. It could be sitting out in nature. Whatever it is to relax, you need to do it every day to look after your gut health. And finally, exercise. We know that exercise is really good for our brain, good for our bones, good for our heart, but it's also really good independent of diet for the diversity of our gut. So people who exercise more tend to have a very uh, more varied gut diversity and it's sustained exercise what's needed. So it's no point um, going out on the weekend once a week and getting your heart rate up. We need to be doing exercise on most days, but it doesn't need to be intense. Just anything that gets your heart rate up, it could be a walk, it could be some gardening, it could be some yoga or Pilates, whatever gets your heart rate up a little bit for about 30 minutes on most days is enough to look after your microbiota. When you're active, they're active, and when you're happy, they're happy. Now, there's a lot of questions at the moment around food additives, and the jury's still out a little bit on this one. Um, so I just wanted to include it, though, to be wary of information that you see around where people say that certain additives are terrible for your gut health and you need to avoid them, because to date, we just don't have the evidence. We've got about 400 food additives that are um, deemed safe for our food supply, but these were assessed a long time ago before we knew about the importance of our gut health. Now, currently scientists are re-evaluating these um, additives, but we haven't really seen any negatively impact uh, the gut microbiome too much. There are some really early studies that have shown that emulsifiers, which are additives in food that stop things separating like mayonnaise, uh, could possibly have a negative effect. But I do want to note that there have been found some studies that also came to the conclusion that they don't have a negative effect. But it's something to keep in mind because it's an emerging space and it may come out in a couple of years that it, it, it may be recommended to reduce some of those additives. Now, the good news is that these additives are going to be found in foods that are more processed anyway. And given that our new shift for our diet is in less processed foods, more plant foods, you're going to be coming across less additives anyway. So it's just another reason why we should be focusing on um, minimally processed foods um, to make up the bulk of your diet, but including small amounts is likely going to be fine, especially if you are focusing on um, maximizing the amount of plant foods you eat every day. What about uh, fermented foods you say? I see so many um, commercial products available, so much marketing about the benefits of fermented foods on the gut. Now, test tube studies show us that fermented foods are linked with health benefits like blood sugar control and weight management. And of course, they contain live probiotics. They contain their own bacteria. So surely eating them is gonna boost our good bacteria, right? Well, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of convincing evidence that indicates that we all should be eating them every day for good health. We have some correlational studies where we look at diets of different cultures and, and um, historically, when we look back at historical diets, they tended to be high in these fermented foods and they tended to have some good gut health. However, we don't know the true mechanisms behind this and was it just because they were eating fermented foods or was it because they were eating them because most of them are vegetables anyway? So is it just the benefits of having the plant or is it that they're fermented we're not sure what we do know is that we do need to be a little bit conscious about the marketing claims about them and so the scientist in me says you don't need to have these foods to be healthy focus on having lots of fresh natural foods instead but the nutritionist and the cook insight in me says experiment and have fun and these foods can be really enjoyable to eat they can be really enjoyable to make so have a go if you want to they're not going to cause you any harm unless you have some IBS or some, some severe symptoms, sometimes they don't agree with people, um, in which case don't feel like you're missing out on anything too much. Um, we know that, yes, yeah, so we know that they're plant foods and they're going to be giving us some nutrients anyway. Some other fermented foods that you might like to try and include kefir, potset yogurt um, that have, have activated live cultures in them, uh, tempeh, kombucha, 
kimchi, miso and sauerkraut. So they're all some interesting ways just to get some different foods in. And as I said, the benefit is they're all whole foods anyway. So you're going to be getting other nutrients out of them in case the probiotics don't actually make a difference. And what about probiotic supplements? I bet you're wondering. Now, this is a really confusing one, I think, because every week we see the, the media promoting the use of taking supplements and saying probiotic supplements are really important. And then the next week they'll say they're a waste of time. Well, the truth is somewhere in the middle, as you were probably expecting. Now, probiotics are live bacteria supplements. So you'll notice them in the fridge at your local pharmacy because they need to be kept alive in, in the ideal environment. Now, what we are not sure about is the effect that they have in pill form. How do they get past our stomach acids and enzymes? Do they survive all the way down to the large intestine? But what's even more important is which ones do we actually need? Okay, so there are some broad spectrum probiotics, but the chances of you actually needing to boost those particular strains could be quite unlikely. Now, research is showing us at the moment that there are some really specific use of probiotics that are helpful. Um, one of those is in antibiotic induced diarrhea. So if you've been given a a course of antibiotics and it's causing diarrhea there's a particular strain in a particular dose that you can take and it can alleviate that diarrhea now if the diarrhea isn't a problem or you don't get diarrhea from antibiotics we know that your gut health bacteria will resume its normal status quo in about two weeks anyway so it's certainly not essential but it is there as an option what we think is going to happen because there is so much research going on with these probiotics is we are going to get better at it and soon it's going to be like medication there's going to be specific um, strains of specific doses for a specific duration for specific purposes and it's going to be the job of you know doctors and dietitians to be able to diagnose for you at the moment there's no benefit for having a general purpose one for hedging your bets chances are it might not even make it all the way down to your um, large bowel anyway and even if it does who's to say that you're lacking in those particular bacteria anyway it's much more useful that you spend those dollars on getting some more plant foods and more interesting foods into your day um, than spending it on supplements I think that's much more useful and we'll just finish off now with some myth busting so these are some common myths I hear about gut health uh, that really need to be be cleared up I think and the first one is that sugar is bad for the gut so sugary food, lollies, table sugar, um, people say that it, it, it kills your good gut bacteria and it feeds your bad gut bacteria bacteria and this just isn't true if you think back to how the digestive system works sugar is a really simple sugar it's easily digested it gets absorbed further up the digestive system it doesn't even make it down into our large intestine so this one simply isn't true on the fact it doesn't make it down there um, we don't have any evidence to say that diets high in added sugar um, tend to have reduced microbiome activity but what we do know is that people that do tend to eat more added sugar in their diet do tend to eat less plant foods which isn't a good thing we also don't want to be filling up on foods that are high in sugar or say fruit juices because they get absorbed so high up you're essentially starving your bacteria of a potential meal so it's so fine to eat foods with added sugar in sometimes let's say you just wanted a small handful of lollies or you wanted a fruit juice could you pair it with something else that's going to feed your gut as well make them happy let's say you're making a cake at home because you really like that combination of you know refined flour and sugar that's fine could you make it a chocolate beetroot cake because your gut is going to love the beetroot so think about nourishing them as well while it's okay to nourish your soul a little bit uh, with some added sugar I also hear a lot that you need to detox to clean your gut and this just isn't true. There just seems to be this penchant for finding the quick fix that a detox offers and unfortunately it's not true. What we do know is people that follow fad diets that are very restrictive, they can end up with reduced gut bacteria so it could actually end up being harmful. So there's absolutely no evidence that supports these detox diets um, and you can actually run into trouble by taking detox supplements for example, um, any supplements that contain charcoal they can take away some interfere with your nutrient absorption as well so I don't recommend anything that's got a detox on the label or any protocol that says detox I'd steer clear of it uh, a gluten-free diet can help to eliminate a range of health issues so this is re really topical um, I think at the moment in terms of gut health because of course people who have celiac disease who are allergic to gluten can suffer from significant gut issues 
unless they follow a gluten-free diet. But that doesn't mean that everybody benefits from going without gluten. It's just like saying that somebody with a nut that, you know, because some people are allergic to nuts that we should all avoid nuts that's just not true if you are you don't have celiac disease then including foods that have gluten in them like whole grain wheat can be really beneficial to your gut bacteria removing gluten from your diet takes away so many food options that could otherwise be contributing to positive gut health so if you suspect that you could have a gluten intolerance or an allergy, you really need to get that looked at by a GP or a dietitian because as I mentioned earlier, it could even be something different that's affecting you. You really need to get to the bottom of it uh, without restricting your diet. Uh, eating enough plant foods is essential for good gut health. Now, this is an interesting one because it is true, but it's not the whole story. So while we you know, do recommend getting enough fiber, what many of us um, neglect is, is often the types of fiber that aren't quite good enough. So you could make up your required amount of fiber by eating lots of processed refined white grains. What we need to be looking at besides just the number of the grams of fiber a day is the quality and the type of fiber. So making sure that we're looking at whole fruits, whole veggies, can you keep the skin on? say your potatoes and your apples try not to peel them go for your whole grain um, pasta and brown rice and uh, wholemeal flour for baking those kind of things to get even more bang for your buck to make sure that you're feeding those microbes exactly what they need and then finally that probiotics are the key to good gut health i know if you get on and google gut health what's going to come up is some recipes for some kimchi or perhaps an advert for some supplements and hopefully we've debunked that already for you that while it's okay to be adding in some probiotics and it may be a good thing what we really need to do is look after the bacteria that's already in there and i quite like the analogy if you imagine a beautiful colorful fish tank right now and then all of a sudden the fish start dying the water looks a little bit murky things aren't very happy the last thing we want to do is go straight to the pet shop buy some more fish and put them back in the tank it's probably not going to be doing anything we need to look after the tank and find out what's going in there first give it a good clean out look after the fish that are in there and feed them what they want to eat um, and you'll find that they'll flourish and they'll reproduce and they tend to look after themselves that way so we don't always need to jump to um yeah the next best thing you don't need to spend an awful lot of money to be healthy it can be as simple as eating more plant foods and getting 30 different foods in your day so thank you very much for joining us we've got a list of links for you to follow with some more information and that you can take you to your gp or dietitian if you have any more concerns um, and if you've got any questions for me, feel free to contact me on Facebook or Instagram at Sarah Moore Nutrition or via my website, sarahmorewellness.com.au.